Okay, well, welcome back. Uh, thank you again for uh, participating uh, this morning on a wet Friday morning. Uh, it's it's um, great to see a, a, a good group here still. And again, I know there are a lot of people watching online. And uh, welcome to you as well. Um, I'm delighted to have uh, on either side of me uh, two people who individually would be um, a, uh, a headline uh, maker here um, uh, talking about uh, well, a lot of issues, but, but certainly about the G20. I'm delighted to have both of them uh, at the same time uh, for a conversation about uh, the G20 and what to look forward to in the next couple of months up to the summit in St. Petersburg. Um, on my left is the second of the two former bosses that I alluded to earlier when I introduced Caroline. Uh, David Lipton uh, is deputy, first deputy managing director of the IMF. Um, he um, <coughs> has been uh, in that role for almost two years, I think. Um, uh, David and I work together at the White House and at Treasury. Uh, he has a long, distinguished career in international finance, in the private sector, in, uh, in the, at the IMF, um, in uh, the U.S. Treasury, uh, and uh, in academia. And uh, I think he's actually a pretty well-known figure here in Washington. Um, and so um, uh, welcome to him. Oh, I should have said he got his PhD from an obscure uh, institution in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, because that's a lead into our other uh, uh, speaker. Uh, Ksenia Yudayeva is the Russian uh, uh, Sherpa, uh, the G20 Sherpa, and that's a big responsibility this year as Russia hosts. Um, she's also chief of the President's uh, Experts Directorate in the Executive Office of the Russian President. Um, uh, Ksenia uh, has been in that <coughs> office for uh, over a year now, I think, um, and uh, has taken on recently the role of organizing the St. Petersburg Summit and all the many related um, aspects of, of a hosting uh, year in the G20. Um, she was, uh, prior to her government service, again, has a long, uh, distinguished career in international economics, including as chief econ economist at Sverbank, um, and she also worked at the uh, rival uh, uh, Washington think tank in the Moscow office of the Carnegie Endowment, um, and uh, in addition to uh, degrees from Moscow State University and the New Economics School, she also, again, has a PhD from another obscure uh, institution in uh, Cambridge, Mass. Uh, which you can read about in the biography here. So delighted to have them both here. We're going to go through the G20 agenda, starting with the kind of core three uh, pillars that were just talked about in the last panel. Um, and let's do them one by one. So we'll start with the sort of macro growth, global growth uh, story. And I wanted to ask David, um, uh, you just, uh, the IMF just issued an update of its uh, uh, regular annual uh, World Economic Outlook uh, just this week. And uh, you downgraded uh, slightly the, the outlook for the global economy. When I looked back at the April um, release, uh, I noticed one thing that really stood out as a difference. Um, back in April, you were, um, you were pretty positive about conditions in emerging markets. Um, you even had a headline in the, in the summary of the, of the WIO that said, you know, reaccelerating activity in emerging markets and developing economies. What happened? Let me start by saying just a couple words about the G20. I think the G20 as a group has been a very important one. And it uh, started with um, the Washington meeting in uh, 2008. And then through the London summit and the Pittsburgh summit in 2009, it really addressed the question, how do we stop this crisis uh, in the midst of a financial crisis? And how do we make sure it never happens again? And I think th in the work that the G20 has done over the years, uh, we've seen uh, very good cooperation among the G20 to uh, uh, deal with the most acute phases of crisis. Um, but we're now faced with the fact that uh, recovery is disappointing. And it's never really taken hold as strongly as we would like. Uh, yes, we have, uh, in our most recent outlook, downgraded growth. Uh, a little bit. We've been saying for some time that we see three-speed growth with the most rapid growth in emerging markets, uh, with some recovery, but not strong enough recovery in the U.S. Uh, and a few other countries, uh, and still quite disappointing uh, situation in Europe where uh, the Eurozone remains in recession. Um, I think, Matt, you're absolutely right that one of the more substantial revisions this time has been that uh, the emerging market world has slowed somewhat. Now, uh, to keep it in perspective, it's still the fastest growing part of the world. 
And uh, it's always hard to gauge exactly uh, how high growth can be for how long in uh, the emerging market world. But I think we are seeing uh, some slowdown, and uh, we're looking at the reasons uh, for that. Um, but we also downgraded growth in uh, other parts of the world. In essence, everywhere except Japan, we've downgraded growth at least uh, a little bit. But again, keeping this all in perspective, I think the, the, the main point that, uh, that uh, I, I would want you to take away is that growth has slowed somewhat in the uh, latter part of last year and in the first part of this year. We see it accelerating a bit, re some recovery this year and into next year. But we see growth as remaining uh, insufficiently strong uh, to deal with the uh, challenge of creating jobs uh, at, a, at a pace that will allow uh, uh, countries to reduce unemployment rates satisfactorily. And coming back to our subject of the day, I think what that means is that there is an important role for the G20, uh, which has, of course, countries from each of the uh, uh, country categories, advanced, uh, emerging, uh, uh, different uh, regional distributions, each of the countries in, in the G20 to play a part, to work together in the G20 to try to find ways to, through collective action, to contribute to uh, a stronger uh, recovery. And we have uh, been uh, speaking about uh, that for some time, and we'll continue to take it up in this uh, G20. I, I do want to come back setting. to the sort of policy response, but just on the outlook itself, you mentioned Europe. Um, uh, I mean, I, I sort of, again, see a sort of schizophrenia in a way about Europe, because on the one hand, in the April release, you seem sort of palpably relieved that the Euro area is not about to um, break up. Um, and, and, and this time, you know, you expressed, and you just did again, a concern that Europe is not performing well enough, but then you show it accelerating or turning from yeah. Um, recession to, to positive growth, you know, fairly substantially over the next 18 months. How should we think about Europe? Um, well, well Europe's been a major yeah. subject, of course, of the G20's sure. focus in the last 18 months, two years. I mean, Europe has uh, been afflicted by crisis. I think uh, it's taken a number of important decisions, uh, Europe-wide decisions, individual country decisions that have greatly reduced the risk, the tail risks of quite acute crisis. But we still see recession, and we still see uh, uh, very significant problems in peripheral countries, and, not, uh, and, and a weakening of uh, growth in the core countries. So when we go through this, uh, we don't see any, unfortunately, we don't see a single silver bullet. It's not as though there's one policy pedal that you push and growth uh, is restored. Rather, our recipe includes uh, seeking action, policy action, on every margin where there is some room to provide help. And that is, uh, we, we believe that uh, stronger monetary policy accommodation is uh, necessary, that uh, we've seen uh, a, a kind of banking fragmentation across Europe and uh, the uh, a failure of uh, uh, banks to uh, uh, provide credit that's supportive of recovery. And so we think there's work for the ECB, the European Central Bank, uh, and uh, others in Europe to try to work on improving the channels of transmission so that monetary policy is, provides an impulse and uh, that that is felt more broadly. Uh, we see a, a, a job for continued fiscal adjustment, but adjustment at a pace <coughs> that's uh, determined country by country, uh, where countries uh, that really need to adjust quickly do so, but countries that have some elbow room to provide support for their economies uh, do that. And a range of structural uh, reforms that can be uh, supportive of growth and raising potential growth over time. And lastly, uh, we see an important role for improving some of the architecture of Europe itself. It's been, in a sense, an imperfect currency zone and economic union. It's a, it's a single market for goods, but it's been, in the European Union, 27 markets for banks with individual supervisors. We've been pushing, among other things, banking union uh, with a whole set of steps that uh, we think will uh, help improve the functioning of the banks and capital markets in uh, Europe and provide some impetus for growth. And that, I think that agenda now is, uh, it's certainly been taken up. I think that agenda is progressing and, uh, you know, on the presumption that monetary policy will provide some more accommodation and that the plans for um, 
banking union and some of the fixes to the architecture go forward, on that basis we see uh, some recovery in Europe in the coming year. Okay, let me bring Ksenia into the conversation. Before we talk about your role in the G20, let me just ask you as a Russian economist, um, uh, Russia's actually doing reasonably well, and as the ambassador earlier indicated, you're debt-free, you have, you know, um, not many of the problems that, that many of the other countries that we're talking about here today have. So, first of all, sort of what's the outlook for Russia, but then more broadly, when you look out on the world, what do you see and what do you worry about in terms of the macroeconomic picture? Let's see. Well, Russia is doing uh, reasonably well, I agree with this assessment, but Russia is very much concerned with the trends in the global economy and in the Russian economy this year uh, because Russia's growth has slowed down uh, both uh, generally after 2008, but this year in particular. Uh, and we believe that this is largely a result of several global tendencies, including recession in Europe uh, and slowdown in some major European countries, and including slowdown in Russia. Uh, so the, the global growth slowdown, which we observed this year and which the IMF predicts, is a challenge for Russia as well as for other G20 economy. And this is why it's important for our economies to discuss this issue and maybe come up with some ideas how we're going to uh, address this issue, how we, go, how we are going to move uh, forward. Uh, well, let me say a couple of words personally kind of as an economist rather than government official. I think that uh, the world are, uh, went through several um, stages after the crisis. There was a huge decline in 2008, which was the result of the financial meltdown. Uh, then uh, there was some recovery, which was also um, in some countries fueled by extensive uh, monetary and fiscal policies. But now it looks like the world is uh, going through the structural adjustments, which we all knew uh, uh, were supposed to happen uh, before we move to the balanced growth stage. Right, and I'm speaking mainly about China, for example. <coughs> we all knew that both China and the US, for example, need to uh, go through some structural adjustment in, in order to get out of this uh, big deficit between the two countries, right? And I think that our, some adjustments happened in the United States and China is starting to go through, through these adjustments. Uh, uh, right now, they are not using anymore the same tools which they used to use back in 2009 and to support growth. They are going through a rethinking stage. And, uh, but these structural adjustments in China will have significant impact on structural adjustment and probably require some structural adjustments in other countries. So this is a stage where the world is uh, getting into. Uh, one more uh, issue which Mm, was uh, quite surprisingly on the agenda for the last month. This is exit strategies and effect of this uh, exit policy, monetary exit from monetary policies on other countries. Uh, Russia, as well as most of uh, the 20 countries, uh, experienced a significant financial market volatility after some rumors that the United States is, uh, and our Federal Reserve is going to scale down its purchases of government bonds. Uh, right, so I think that the impression was that uh, as soon as um, uh, crisis will be over, growth will stabilize, central banks will be able to uh, scale down their non-traditional policy financial sector will be less volatile, right? The last month proved to all of us that uh, volatility is probably <coughs> just good of ours for a number of years to come, uh, even after growth will stabilize, but because central banks will have to get out of uh, the non-traditional policies, right? So it's also something which needs, uh, needs to be rethought uh, by uh, mainly financial ministers and central banks of uh, G20 countries, whether they would like to uh, approach this volatility, how, uh, et cetera, right? It's, it's a big new issue, uh, which is back on, 
uh, which is on the agenda right now after the events. Well, I, I want to ask David about exit strategies, and if I don't, I'm sure somebody in the audience is going to. But, bef but, but let me take this back up to the G20 level again and say, I mean, it's interesting you talk about rebalancing, but <coughs> it sort of feels as though the, the, the Pittsburgh framework, which you know, had those three big adjectives, strong, sustained, and balanced growth, um, that the, the talk about the framework itself and about the, the mutual assessment process under the framework, you don't hear sort of as much discussion of that. Does that mean because you know, we've sort of solved the problem, we don't need the, ma the map, um, or am I mischaracterizing where we are in that? I mean, yeah. what, what role does the G20 and those, uh, the framework and the map play in addressing these? I think you ask a very important question. And you know, as I said before, I think our premise is that there's a need for more growth virtually everywhere. And there is no single silver bullet. So you have to look at every margin. Uh, global rebalancing is one of those margins. And uh, there's been, I think, some um, uh, complacency that's set in because global imbalances have gone down somewhat. If you look at uh, the Chinese surplus, it was uh, 8, 9, 10 percent, and now it's 2 and a half, 3 percent. Um, you can look at uh, other imbalances uh, around the world. They've gone down somewhat. But the question is whether those imbalances have gone down because of rebalancing or because the economy slowed and uh, exporters aren't exporting, importers aren't importing. Uh, I think we're going to find that imbalances are... Uh, diminished, but not uh, in a permanent way, and that there really is still work to be done uh, to uh, promote rebalancing, and that that can be a significant uh, contributor to strengthening global growth. Now, what I think we need is a G20 process of peer review, something that the G20's talked about uh, really from its inception, but hasn't uh, made enough of. And I hope that uh, as this uh, Russian presidency goes on, and this one is uh, virtually finished with the Leaders' Summit coming up in September, but as we move then into the uh, Australian uh, presidency that follows, that we can have a process where the G20 sit down together and have a more serious peer review, and not a general one, but one that's more specific, where countries can talk quite earnestly about what uh, they feel others could do to contribute, to make a contribution. And perhaps in that way, through that dialogue, reach some uh, agreements on collective action that would be useful for everybody. That, that sounds like a good idea. I mean, this is a group of uh, the, the, the main economies in the world, and they are peers, and they uh, have an opportunity to, to review. What, Ksenia, is this going to be part of the Russian agenda in St. Petersburg? <coughs> and uh, how, how are you framing uh, the, the, the macro discussion. Um, and I want to specifically, as a follow-up, ask you about your financing for investment um, category, which is under, under your theme of growth and jobs. But uh, actually, uh, right now we started to discuss, Carolyn, I think, in, uh, in the morning, I already told you that we had a meeting today in the morning. We started to discuss how we're going to structure the discussion of macro issues at this summit itself, uh, right? But are clearly leaders will discuss um, many of the topics which we are discussing now and give their own view. But I think that the process which David is speaking about is the process within the uh, so-called group or which does uh, this framework. <coughs> uh, I'm not Excuse sure me. that everybody here in the audience are familiar with how the 20s. That would organized. be helpful, so, actually. Uh, uh, let me yeah. tell you this. It was actually revealing for me. I, I was a newcomer to the 20s, so I realized how big the, uh, is G20 and uh, how many different processes involved and how it works. So, uh, G20, of course, has everybody knows about Leaders Summit, right? Leaders Summit happens once a year, uh, and there is also Sherpa process preparation for the summit, and uh, ministers of finance uh, process uh, the prepare meetings of the ministers of finance and central bankers themselves, and also mm, prepare the financial part for the leaders' summit. Uh, apart from that, uh, there are on, on many issues which are on the agenda, there are special working group or task forces uh, with experts uh, from different countries which discuss the specific issues in more detail. So, there is this expert level discussion 
uh, which reports either to Sherpers or financial ministers, and then from financial ministers and Sherpers we report to the presidents, right? So it's a multi-layer uh, process. Uh, and uh, there is a group within the financial track which is actually called the framework for um, sustainable and balanced growth. And I think that when, when David says that country ne countries need to sit with each other and as peers discuss what's going on, it's uh, largely supposed to happen inside this, the, this group. I don't think that leaders have uh, enough uh, time for such, such, such a deep discussion. I think the, the idea was uh, also to do this on, on the uh, working level, and it actually uh, happens to, 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 to some extent du during those uh, uh, framework uh, uh, meetings, m maybe not as deep as we, uh, it was perceived from, from the beginning. Uh, but I'm actually happy that um, David is raising this issue because from the very beginning there was a controversy about the role of the IMF and the role of the framework itself because it was the IMF who did this uh, review uh, for the 20 from and still doing this, is still doing it uh, and uh, <coughs> now the, the framework is doing it itself so uh, the separation of obligation between the IMF and the framework purpose is an interesting issue to, to discuss as well um, but uh, anyway so there is this group work, working group discussion level sherpas and financial ministers uh, and are like for me like one of the things which I learned um, during this process about what G20 uh, is doing. Uh, G20 is a forum where you have all these different countries sitting around the table, discussing issues on different level, and still. Uh, well, we are in the so-called multipolar world, so we have a lot of distrust, misunderstanding, different views on uh, from different countries and different levels. And I think that our uh, when he provides the forum for the dialogue and for bringing together the, the views and for building trust among countries. And I, I think that this is one of the issues which we we need to understand. I. I'm in my role as a Sherpa, I'm permanently asked the question, uh, is the 20 efficient or not efficient, whether it was efficient in the very <laughs> beginning, whether it was <laughs> efficiency uh, right now, or uh, etc. cetera. I, I think that um, this is really the issue about uh, trust between countries uh, with each other, because our, there are, Mm, well, we are probably not living in the zero sum world, but some countries still may believe that the benefit, others benefit more from some policies than, than them. And um, building trust through this discussion is an important task for the 20 as well. And well, rebalancing is one of the issues where right. this is needed. No, I personally agree very much that the habits of cooperation that are being built in the G20 is one of its real uh, assets and something that people underestimate the importance of, but it's actually quite important um, to get this group of countries that haven't had these conversations before and uh, maybe don't have the, the full amount of trust. I do want to come back to the institutional questions, but we have a lot to cover, and let me just move on. But one more question about the macro sort of side of things. Um, David, there, there's been a lot of angst in the world about recently about competitive exchange rate uh, depreciations, and um, yet the IMF seems to take a relatively benign view of this. Um, and uh, you've been criticized for being not vigilant enough and not uh, outspoken enough about, about these issues. Um, the whole raison d'etre for the establishment of the IMF was to address this set of issues. How do you respond to that criticism, if it's fair, no, no. If, it, if it exists? We've been asked by the G20, by our whole membership, to uh, look at how policies in any one country spill over and affect other countries, and we're doing that. And uh, I think uh, when we look at that in the recent period, we've identified those spillovers, um, and we're on the, we're in a sense, on the lookout for uh, policies that are misguided and causing uh, problems or potential problems. Most of the focus in uh, early part of this year was on the unconventional monetary policies that a number of central banks, 
in different ways at different times, US, UK, uh, European Central Bank, and Bank of Japan have been carrying out. When we look at those policies, we see that uh, the, 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 we see the clear rationale that central banks have for these policies. In a setting where economies are sluggish, uh, inflation is falling and is below targeted levels, um, interest rates are, have already been reduced to zero, so the central banks haven't any uh, or very much uh, conventional monetary policy instrumentation left. Um, and at a time when fiscal policy room for maneuver is limited by uh, high deficits and high debts, uh, unconventional monetary policies have actually made, at various points, important contributions, either in stabilizing markets that have become illiquid and non-functional, or in supporting uh, a modicum of economic recovery. So, you know, we, we start by recognizing that when countries are pursuing important domestic objectives with important benefits, and we see benefits coming from unconventional monetary policy, that uh, has to be uh, their core consideration. Now, of course, there can be negative spillovers from policies pursued for good reasons and with good results. And we've looked around at that. Uh, but we've not seen, on, in general, we've not seen the, the two things you would look for would be whether currencies were getting out of alignment, whether they were getting away from what could be justified by fundamentals, uh, and in a sense creating imbalances that were undesirable, or spillovers where the liquidity creation and the asset purchases being undertaken under this rubric of unconventional monetary policy were raising asset prices in a way that either caused asset bubbles or threatened to cause asset bubbles. And when we look around, we don't see that. We haven't seen that. So I, you know, the, 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 the concern over currency wars, I think, was overblown early in the year. There were currency worries. We were asked to follow up on those worries. Uh, our results are pretty much as I just <coughs> said. But interestingly, if anything, the situation has flipped rather the other way around, where what countries were concerned about early in the year was that this liquidity was leading to capital flows into emerging market countries that was causing their exchange rates to strengthen, causing them to lose competitiveness, and threatening their growth. But of course, with the discussion and uh, attention now around whether or not the Fed's going to start to taper, uh, in essence, diminish the amount of unconventional monetary policy, what we've seen is quite the opposite. We've seen capital flowing out of emerging market countries, their currencies uh, weakening, and uh, the concern has really changed uh, around. Now, in this episode, we too, again, we are being asked to look at this process. Uh, to assess uh, the ways in which um, uh, the uh, markets are reacting to what the Fed uh, is, is doing and saying. And, uh, you know, that's something we, we take into account as we give our advice to emerging market countries about uh, how to respond. And we'll, so we'll, we'll be involved in, in that process uh, as well. I don't know if you want to comment on that. I wanted to move on the agenda and talk about financial regulation just okay, briefly. Let's, let's move okay, on. so um, Mark Sobel was up here earlier and, and gave a, a good overview of the um, the, the, the extensive uh, array of work that's been done through the Financial Stability Board on uh, Basel III capital requirements on um, systemically important financial institutions, OTC derivatives, shadow banking, whole range of issues. What, what do you see as the main sort of gaps in this area, and what what is Russia concerned about? What does it want to um, do this year to advance the, uh, the, the international financial regulatory agenda? Uh, well, uh, as, um, from, from what I know, I, I should uh, kind of say from the very beginning that Europe is to not control financial negotiations. That's yes. right. That's but from, from, from what I know, uh, yes, is uh, that uh, there are lots of discussions uh, on the extraterritorial nature of American regulation, and there are lots of concern with that in, in G20. Uh, it includes uh, OTC derivatives uh, and some, some other uh, areas, and this has been concern for, for 
uh, many uh, countries uh, to, to some extent in, in for Russia, but uh, maybe not 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 that much. But but that's uh, a concern. So um, this is the issue which everybody is discussing. I think that. Um, mm, we still need to come with a solution what to do with the rating agencies and uh, price reporting uh, agency on the um, uh, on the our commodities market uh, but but the agenda is uh, uh, <coughs> so I think that uh, most of was supposed to be achieved this year what has been achieved this one world on uh, Basel III, right? Uh, there is a lot of discussions about whether Basel III should be introduced now or its introduction should be delayed or because of the considerations of the effect we should uh, may have on growth. And we have the same discussion in Russia, for example. Russian Central Bank was supposed to introduce Basel III in uh, October. Uh, mm, but uh, right now, what we hear from 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 the central bank is that it may, uh, after conversations with uh, the banking uh, community, it may uh, extend the deadline some, uh, somewhat and to introduce it in uh, January as well as America uh, has decided. Right, but I think that it will uh, introduce it. Uh, uh, maybe not. Uh, at the dates where it was supposed to do it at the very beginning, but sometimes later. I, I, I'm conscious of time, and I want to give the audience enough time, and I have at least two other topic areas I want to talk to. So unless you're burning to say something about um, FinRag, um, I'm going to ask a question about the third big area, which is um, uh, reform of the international financial architecture, which again, uh, Mark Sobel talked about in the last round, um, which you know initially was focused on kind of reallocating shares and chairs in the, in the international financial institutions like the World Bank and IMF to reflect the shift of the center of gravity in the world economy, especially towards large emerging countries. And, and Ksenia, um, I noticed that you've um, characterized this whole area as trust and transparency. Why and what does that mean? And, and what do you, again, hope to get done? <laughs> well, trust and transparency is one of the priority of uh, mm, Russian presidency. We actually, uh, our approach this year was not to introduce any new topic or try not to introduce any new topic to the discussion because there are already very many issues on the table and the 20 is becoming non-manageable because of that. Uh, but we introduce several principles through which we look on all the existing areas already, and trust and transparency is uh, one of them. Uh, and as an example, I can mention what, what we do in the energy area. Um, for example, on the 20, um, used to support the so-called duty oil and duty gas initiative for already for a number of years. And these two initiatives is collection on data on physical uh, volumes of uh, production and uh, sales of uh, oil and gas. Uh, and Russia organized a seminar with market participants uh, and discussed with them how they use the data, whether they use them at all, uh, what do they think are is um, how how this data set can be improved in order to be more useful for market participants? And actually, we learned quite a lot after the seminar, are uh, because uh, we were told that uh, information about financial transactions right now is uh, as important as information on uh, final um, kind of users and our uh, producers. Uh, because on the commodity markets, uh, all those intermediary uh, players, traders, financial players, uh, they became so big that uh, they can dramatically change the uh, situation. Uh, on, on, on the market and uh, the, the existence needs to be taken into account and all models all should be rethought uh, in order to um, understand how markets are going to move. And I think that this is one of the areas where we are now looking for practical solutions. One of the solutions which was uh, offered to us at, at the seminars is to improve the regulation of transparency of uh, trades in, in order to uh, change the um, situation. Uh, 
Um, so th this is just one of the example how we are use this uh, principle of transparency uh, in order to or improve and to come up with some practical solutions in okay. 20. David, on the, on the sort of the original sort of uh, purpose of this topic, which was to again shift sort of the balance of power in a way. I mean, have the United States and other advanced economies hurt themselves and hurt the effectiveness of the IMF by? frankly, dragging their feet on, on some of these shifts, and particularly the quota reform. I think it's important if the world's going to call upon the IMF to go in and fight crisis and deal with the new problems that uh, the world faces, uh, the IMF has to have legitimacy. And it can't be viewed as the pawn of any one country or a group of countries. Uh, the world is changing with the rapid growth of uh, emerging market countries, and those, the changes in economic importance have to be reflected in our governance structure across the whole spectrum of dimensions in which you, you might want to deal with that. And so, you know, there have been changes in our governance structure and uh, changes in our quota system and in our, um, uh, the way our executive board uh, governance works, but there have not yet been enough. We have reforms that have been uh, decided in 2010 and uh, approved by many countries, but not yet approved by the United States uh, of America. I think that uh, it is quite clear that the IMF serves an important uh, uh, role in, uh, in uh, promoting global financial stability and global growth. That's something that's good for all our members and, in particular, good for the United States. So it makes sense for the United States to stand behind the IMF as an institution. And I know that there is legislation uh, being considered right now to uh, put forward the, the um, quota increase and in governance reforms that uh, uh, have been uh, uh, proposed and, and, and adopted by many countries, and I hope that will go through. I think it's very hard to see how our role can continue uh, as it needs to, unless our governance is as modern as uh, the, mo the, 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 the global economy. Excellent. Um, Ksenia, I wanted to give you an opportunity before we go to the audience to just talk about the rest of the agenda. You talked a little about energy, uh, but there's trade, there's um, anti-corruption, there's development. Um, do you want to quickly summarize sort of what Russia wants to get done in some of those areas? Okay, uh, so on, on trade, uh, we are, first of all, we support the Bali meeting, uh, we, uh, and uh, we, we are trying to build consensus around extending the non-protectionist uh, stance. Uh, also, uh, we are, uh, came up with the proposal of uh, establishing some principles of transparency of the RTAs, which are completely in line with uh, the WTO uh, process, um, but still we think that it's important in this world, which needs trust and transparency, uh, to have these principles of uh, transparency of uh, the regional trade agreements. Uh, then uh, uh, in development area, uh, this is uh, an important year. Uh, because development uh, was put on the agenda uh, at the CEO uh, at the CEO summit, uh, and uh, most of the plan, the, uh, nine pillar plan, uh, was supposed to be completed uh, by the end of this year. Uh, so in the development area, we are going through two exercises. Uh, one of them is accountability exercise. Uh, we are, are um, analyzing all what was done in the development area to fulfill this uh, CEO plan. And another one is uh, preparation of uh, <coughs> the, uh, let me call it some kind of building blocks or ideas for, for the uh, new plan. The group now has come up with some specific language. I frankly forgot what the exact word they, they use right now. It's no plan, no framework, it's something else. But anyway, so we are developing these new ideas which will be fitted in the, the new uh, plan on, on development. And let me say one, one, one last thing. Uh, G20 will be five years this year. Uh, so uh, uh, this means that this accountability exercise or 
uh, is becoming more and more important for the 20 and we are doing this here accountability in development and in in the framework uh, and uh, some other groups are doing similar exercise. For example, labor group uh, is doing um, what we call monitoring exercise, collection of some best practices on the labor markets in, in different uh, countries. Uh, and this, this issue of accountability will probably become more and more important for the 20 uh, four years to come. Okay. Uh, one final question to you I can't resist. Uh, you, I'm guessing, based on having had a little bit of experience in this myself, uh, that you've had a tough year. And I wondered whether your view on whether the G20 should have a secretariat uh, um, to help with this um, has changed at all or evolved during that uh, year. And, and, and sort of part B, what advice would you give to the Australians going forward? Uh, wow. Well, um Actually, my view has, I, have, I have such a good team. I'm very proud of my team. So uh, my, <laughs> my view of you know, I that I made a pitch for changed. Yaks earlier. Yes. Yaks uh, don't get enough respect, so uh, good, good job, uh, Yaks. Yeah, so I have a pretty good Yaks, Svetlana Lukas. And she's very uh, experienced, and she organized the work very well. So I think that there is a positive side in not having a, continue, a constant bureaucracy, but having some domestic people to to work on that, and my advice to the Australians is also uh, try to get some good people on the team and to prepare the 20. They actually uh, preparing very well. I think Australians were studying everything what we are doing uh, from almost from the very beginning, and we have a very good contact with uh, Australian both on uh, political and uh, practical issues. Good. We heard a little from Amanda earlier about the planning, and I'm sure Australia will will do a great job. Uh, this troika process, by the way, of working with the next host and the last host, I think is very important and, and a useful part of the, um, of, of the um, management of this important institution. Okay, I'm going to open it up to questions. I think we have maybe 15 or 20 minutes. If you do have a question, raise your hand, which someone's already done. Wait for the microphone. Identify yourself and please ask a question. Evgenia um, Ustinova from Eurasia Group. Uh, my question is from Ms. Udaiva. Um, can you talk a little bit more about whether you view uh, monetary easing as an effective solution for, specifically for Russia and also for other countries in the G20? Uh, well, you know, as a member oh, in, in Russia, if you follow Russia's domestic uh, discussion, uh, you know, as a member of uh, President administration, I'm trying to minimize my comments on the policy of the central bank. We think that there are okay. too many rumors about its uh, dependence on the uh, uh, government and on the president administration. Uh, and it's actually way more independent when people perceive. Uh, uh, and this is why I would not comment on this question. OK, you're, you're following a good tradition, because Caroline Atkinson, Mark Sobel, and uh, you have all uh, declined to, to comment. Very smart. David, do you want to say anything about that subject? Well, I'll, I'll, I do want to say a general point. First, to say that you can't answer your question as a general matter. Monetary policy um, and macro policy as a whole has to be uh, tailored to the circumstances of individual countries. And there are some that have economic slack. If you look at the periphery of Europe, you have countries with 25, 27 percent unemployment. Uh, that's a very different situation than, uh, say, in Russia. Unemployment is at an all-time low in Russia. Russia faces the question, uh, is growth low because demand is low, demand from the rest of the world? Or is growth low because it's really not profitable enough to invest? And I think that uh, our, we've just had our uh, annual policy dialogue with Russia, and not speaking about monetary policy per se, but about the posture of demand management. I think Russia's essentially uh, at full employment, meaning it's got a low unemployment rate, it has low slack in industry. And uh, it's going to be hard for Russia to boost growth very much by stimulating demand. It might get a little for a while, but it would be at the cost of pushing up inflation, probably pushing down the currency. And that would actually go in the wrong direction from the standpoint of creating an environment in which there could be more investment and more growth. And 
Russia has uh, investment that's between 20 and 22 percent of GDP. It aspires, it's been growing at, in the neighborhood of 3 percent. It aspires to grow in the neighborhood of 5 percent. To do that, it needs to have investment to GDP more in the neighborhood of 25 percent uh, and uh, investment to 25 percent of GDP. To do that, it really needs to put its focus principally on creating an environment in which there can be more business, more investment, and in time, uh, a more rapid growth rate. I should have said David speaks with great authority on this uh, part of the world. Um, he cut his policy teeth in the transitions of the former Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, and so uh, you should listen carefully to what he says about that subject. Okay, next. <coughs> Center for Study of the Presidency. I'm a trade lawyer, so I ask this question with great humility. But uh, the idea of peer review that David Lipton mentioned is, is very attractive. Um, I note, if I understood her correctly, Ms. Yudeva said, well, this sort of happens at the expert level. Uh, even if that's true, uh, perhaps we all agree instinctively uh, that behind David's suggestion is the idea that if these 20 are to move the world economy in a common <coughs> direction, uh, there needs to be <coughs> at least some uh, uh, components of this kind of discipline that a peer review uh, might produce. You've seen a lot of peer review at the IMF, so I just wonder what you would add uh, to your suggestion that sure. is both politically realistic and the elements of the review that you think might most move in a common direction. Let me note first that there was, in some sense, peer review and collective action in Washington at the first G20, and then in, in 2009, both at the London summit and the Pittsburgh summit. The leaders had good discussions. They, took Im they made important commitments. Those commitments were strong enough that they influenced market thinking about the trajectory of the global economy. I think peer review has to start at the expert level, but it can't finish at the expert level. There are certain, obviously, I mean, I think uh, Ksenia is absolutely right. The, the leaders aren't going to sit around and talk about uh, the details of this. But it needs to start at the experts level, be refined to uh, be discussed by finance ministers, and then when, it, when there's really a plan, the leaders impart um, political impetus by reviewing what their finance ministers have suggested and making the commitments. So I see it as a three-tiered process. I think it, as you said, we have peer review at the IMF. That's what we're all about. So it's, it's, it's in a way natural that we would propose that this take place in other fora. It's what we do with our members at our executive board. Um, I think that uh, the G20 is special because it's the only forum it's really the only forum where leaders from this wide a group of countries, countries representing about 85 percent of the GDP of the globe, sit together. And so if this could operate in the way I've described, you and, and people, uh, leaders uh, take commitments, I think those could be meaningful commitments and vis-a-vis -vis the markets quite convincing. Okay. Then was there somebody over there, I think, on the, did you have a question? Gary Kleiman, Kleiman International. I want to ask a general question, uh, not Russia specific, but more <coughs> generally about the emerging market slowdown and the BRICS generally suffering uh, GDP, downward revisions, financial market corrections. How does that affect uh, some of the plans for, let's say, a BRICS development bank or cross investment through uh, the respective sovereign wealth funds? Are those ambitions still priorities on the agenda? And how do you reconcile that with the G20 process uh, in this upcoming summit and in the future? I guess that's for you, Cassandra. Uh, well, I guess that's for me. Uh, while those plans are still on the agenda, there is um, a lot of negotiations going on about specifics of uh, these two instruments, because uh, there are two ideas on the table. One of them is BRICS uh, development banks, uh, and in another one is reserve pool. Uh, so this is, I think, an equivalent 
to the BRICS World Bank and BRICS uh, IMF, right? Uh, the, that's the share of responsibilities. Uh, and uh, now there is a discussion. I think all countries generally support this idea, but now they discuss uh, how to how to structure uh, these two uh, institutions and in uh, more details. Okay, I, I thought I saw. It's hard with the lights to see, but I thought I saw somebody in the back quadrant there. Maybe not. Other questions? Okay, sir. Second row. Yeah. Yep. This gentleman. Hi, um, Don Lee with the LA Times. Uh, this is a question from Mr. Daiva. Uh, I know there's a lot on the agenda for the G20, uh, but could you just say what um, the top two or three outcomes or agreements that the Russian presidency would like to see? Uh, well, um, I think that uh, what we would like to see, first of all, is a good discussion on the global economy. For some practical things which we discussed about some some commitments by 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 countries on um, different uh, areas commitments on uh, sort of future financial uh, strategies uh, but also given that we are going to have ministers of labor and ministers of finance meeting uh, next week uh, we also hope that they can, uh, they will be able to come up with the, some joint statement, uh, which would reconcile the idea of supporting economic growth and employment on the one hand, uh, and uh, budget stability on on, on the other. Uh, then our mm, on on trade, I already said this is extension of the non-protectionist and support for Bali. Uh, transparency of RTAs, uh, etc. Uh, in the energy, we are launching uh, the uh, um, map uh, website, the Global Marine Protection uh, uh, website. This is a site where uh, exchange on information on our regulation of our uh, energy exploration and transportation and the uh, marine environment and coastal areas uh, will, will take uh, place. Uh, and there are some other small initiatives in this area. Uh, then uh, in the, our development, I already said we are coming up with a new plan. There is one, one idea which I would like to offer to this audience. This is the idea which was suggested to us by C20, and we're still discussing it. C20, this is Civil, Civil 20. 20. Uh, yes, they suggested to rename uh, the uh, framework on uh, balanced and sustainable growth uh, into the framework for balanced, sustainable, and inclusive growth. Uh, and we're still discussing whether we should do this or not, and that's a question for the audience, actually, whether the audience supports this idea or not. And, and they mean to take on issues of inequality? Issues uh, of inequality, in yes. Uh -huh. Okay, interesting. Um, David, there was something I meant to ask you before. You were present at the creation of the G20's work on fossil fuel subsidies, and now the IMF has sort of taken a stand on that as well. Do you want to sort of talk about your thinking about that and how the G20 yeah. has move that forward and what more could be done? Yeah, at, at the IMF, we did a paper uh, in March of this year that quantified the uh, impact of fossil fuel subsidies, showing that they were uh, very large, large enough to be debilitating the budget balance and fiscal sustainability of a number of uh, countries, especially countries in the Middle East, countries in Africa and that the lack of uh, uh, taking action on externalities, meaning uh, energy uh, pricing that doesn't take into account pollution, congestion, and uh, effects on climate change, uh, that these were uh, very substantial in uh, advanced economies in the United States and other adva advanced economies. Our view is that, that uh, addressing uh, energy subsidies would bring very substantial benefits across the globe. And uh, we would like, we're working with our member countries to take action on uh, energy subsidies. It, it is often a politically very sensitive subject, whether you're talking about 
uh, subsidies in developing countries or the lack of treating the externalities in advanced economies. We understand that, uh, but we think it's important enough that this ought to move from discussion uh, to action. Now, the G20 took a commitment in uh, Pittsburgh in 20, 2009 to eliminate fossil fuel subsidies over the medium term. I think the medium term has arrived, and it's time uh, to get on with it. Um, I, I predict that they won't, and that we'll see more action in, in eliminating fossil fuel subsidies uh, in developing countries where they really need to do it in order to uh, have enough resources to take care of their people, to provide health, education spending, infrastructure spending. I think we'll see more action there. But we certainly, as an institution, are uh, encouraging all countries to take action, uh, to plan and take action on reducing energy subsidies. I mean, just to link the last two uh, responses, um, it's important in talking about these issues, and if we talk about inclusive growth and inequality, to note that in the fossil fuels case, David mentioned the political sensitivity, but the reality is that a lot of these subsidies are going to middle-income people, not to the poorest in societies, and so, you know, there, there, I think there's some, some real issues there, and, and one needs to look at this in a sort of fact-based way. But, okay, uh, any other uh, questions from the audience? Um, welcome one or two final ones, if they're burning questions. Again, I can't see everybody, but, uh, no? Okay. All right, well, we, we ended up uh, right on time, I think, so that's perfect. Listen, let me thank both panelists uh, for, for joining us up here. Um, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> uh, um, very helpful and informative. And I think particularly, let me say on behalf of CSIS and our audience, that it's really helpful to have people like you join us because um, I, I work on international economic issues, but most of my colleagues work on, you know, sort of traditional foreign policy issues, and it's hard sometimes to make the connection. I think people see the global governance story as sort of relevant to foreign policy, but I think even the, the, the sort of the hard economic issues that we've been talking about here are also so inter and so importantly with, with foreign policy questions that I think it's very important for, for us to have this conversation. So I really appreciate you both taking Thank time you. and coming all the way from Moscow to join us. So good luck. Thank you for Thank having you. us. Thank you. Yep.